Welcome. Welcome, Miguel. Can can you hear me? I can. How are you doing, Alfred? You well? Yeah, yeah, good. You know, our our audience for the past 15 minutes have been listening to selections from your album into Galactic. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a bit about it. <laughs> so where do I start? Well, um, I mean, I can either start right at the beginning or right at the end and work backwards. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in doing the books that I did, the trilogy, uh, Meet the Hybrids, We Are the Disclosure, and Being with Beings, in that whole kind of process, it was always about, you know, my role was really the kind of social scientist as much as anything. Um, <clears throat> somebody coming in from the outside to study this particular uh, phenomenon and all its many phenomena. And um, it was, it was, it was in that process that, particularly doing Meet the Hybrids, that I started to feel that this was ringing a lot of bells. It was very close to home. Basically, when I heard them speaking about their childhoods, I felt like they were describing my childhood in certain respects. And there's a lot of different triggers, I guess, I had that took me back to my childhood and things that had happened, some very early on, others later, that I didn't, I didn't really connect in any literal sense up until that point. I mean, I'd always felt from when I was very, very young that I was a visitor, that I could not be the same species as, as these people. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's always been that way. But it was not, there was no story to it. There was no narrative. There was no sense of a particular place or a particular uh, identity that I carried into this life. I just felt very, very different. And so what I was hearing from the hybrids was that it took them a long time to kind of put the pieces together. It seemed strange to me at the time. I thought, well, how would you not know what you are? And then I discovered uh, several years into that process that the same thing was really happening with me, that bit by bit, I was starting to feel that this sense of being from somewhere else was not just some idea. It was, it was not imagination, but it was legit. And that's a tricky thing to navigate because so much of the time in my work, one of the most important things I could do is always keep one foot in in rationality, in what we might consider um, standard rationality, what we might consider, okay, that guy is, um, is keeping an even keel on this whole thing, not jumping in, not taking it too seriously, is leaving always the door open for doubt. And, um, <clears throat> And so there's, I, I think for a lot of us who go through something like this, there's a lot of kind of pushing and pulling. It's difficult to accept, certainly at the outset, if you've come into this wishing to be a kind of rational actor in the process, it's difficult to let go and fully kind of immerse and say, no, this, this I think, I believe this to be true about myself. And the way that I, I guess I can make sense of it is that this is all so strange to me that 
it must be my first incarnation here or first in a very long time, something like that. Of course, I have no way of confirming or denying or proving anything, but there is just this permanent, overwhelming feeling of being a visitor here. And there were other things that happened. I mean, one of the most important I've talked about in different um, interviews, and you and I have, may, have, may have discussed this in an interview at some point, but and I, you know, forgive me if people have heard this one before, but when I was talking with uh, Juju, who's in all those books, I asked her, look, do you have any sense of what I might have been before this life? Because I feel like this is all very strange and new to me, human nature. And she said, well, <clears throat> you can ask for a word or an image as you're falling asleep that can come to you in dreams and you can be allowed to remember it. And so I thought, well, that seems all right. That's a, that's a good tip. I will try it. But then she said, um, there's three things she said and only two of them are coming back to me right now. But the, the thing that really jumped out at me, she said, look, you already know. The answers are already inside you. You just have to be willing to hear them or, or something. But I recall her saying, you already know, you already have the answers. And so I said, well, look, I'll explain to you why I'm asking the question and to, you know, talk it out a little bit. And within moments of of starting to do so, I felt I was kind of unplugged. That's that's the sensation that I literally slumped sideways in my chair. And it was like somebody was using my mouth as a loudspeaker because it was not, it was not conscious. It was not the normal operation of my of my uh, speech equipment. Suddenly I found myself saying. In, in, in what felt like a slightly different voice. It was, it was just the most peculiar sensation. And I said, or heard myself say, I have the soul of a wanderer. And, and it came with this kind of booming sensation, this resonant sensation in my solar plexus. And that's only happened a number of times in my life. And only when in the presence of a profound truth which is why I paid attention to it so I went to look up what a, what is a wanderer and I discovered Carla Rukert's book uh, a wanderer's handbook or the wanderer's handbook and in this book I just discovered all these people essentially describing my experience on this world and the strangeness of it and I mean, that was, that really tripped me out. That's, that was kind of tough to take in that it was a confrontation with the possibility that I may genuinely be uh, a newcomer to this place. And, um, and there were other things that, that bubbled up in that time and since, but all of it, I think, has deepened that feeling that um, this is not my world and these are not my people. <clears throat> Even though, you know, there are, you know, plenty of things that impress me about humans and some of which I really love, which is um, love, art and humour. The human ability to love just blows my mind. It's, it's an incredible thing. And humor, I mean, that's always been um, a companion through different eras in my life. And my favorite people are the ones that make me laugh the most. Um, and, um, and art, that 
it's just a constant joy to me. I mean, there's so many great um, uh, there's subreddits and there are um, gr some great Facebook groups. So you can, you know, endless Instagram accounts where you can just tune in and, and encounter this astounding art that people are producing left, right and center on a regular basis. And that is so joyful to me. And, and in fact, at the moment, as we speak, I'm writing an article about this kind of art, about sort of what we could call channeled art or galactic art, or dimensional art, or however people like to identify it. And I'm talking to uh, about 10 artists who all produce art in different um, different kinds of art, but a lot of them, a lot of them paint or draw. And, uh, and so I'm pulling together all that information at the moment in terms of, <clears throat> you know, what role the art plays in their lives, um, where it comes from, what the experience is like, what they gain from it, and um, what the audience gets from it. So I'm putting that together right now. No idea when it will be published. Um, I, magazine lead times are always crazy, but um, yeah, that that's that's where I've where I've come to is is just spending my time, um, excuse me, making music full time. It's having done nine books, I feel like that's a pretty reasonable contribution in writing and. And music is something that is so, it's, it's phenomenally abstract in that it's one of the only art forms you can't see. And yet it is as powerful as any other. And there's melodies that we hear that can maybe take us to places that we have not visited maybe for decades. We can hear a song and suddenly we're, I don't know, seven years old, you know, in our grandparents' uh, backyard or something, hanging out with the family or, or it could be, you know, you remember that was the song that was playing when you proposed to your wife or when you, or you heard it on vacation or whatever it is. And, and it's incredible how vividly the experience comes back to us when we hear that music. And people talk about, you know, in, in, this, in this field in general, kind of cosmic art, however you want to call it, that it is all about frequency, that, you know, people talk endlessly about well, it's light codes, it's encoding, encoding this, that, and the other thing. And some of that, I think, may be conscious, some may be unconscious. If we're going to take as read that that is what it is, and that's how it works. Certainly, that is the overwhelming response from people, that it is communicating with us in often subconscious ways. But it is altering us in, in certain ways. And we know that frequencies have profound influences on their environment, on conscious beings that are around them. I mean, if you think of uh, frequency being able to shed a glass and do all kinds of different things, it's something that we, I mean, we are frequency in so many ways in the, um, you know, breaking us down in terms of the physics of the self, it's all frequency. And so to make music feels as close to that as it gets, because, you know, looking at music theory, you know, it's, it's a lot of math, but it's all about mathematical relationships between these different frequencies and the way I make it on, um, a modular synthesizer, absolutely everything is about frequency. And 
there is certainly a feeling that I get when I listen to certain oscillators that they just, especially if you if you bathe them in in reverb, you know, I've this this gorgeous one called Odessa, which is just I don't know how many it's. Yeah, 512 sine waves, 512 digital sine waves at the maximum. And it just makes this, just the, the sound of this thing has this effect, especially in, in, in a huge shimmering pool of reverb. It is so transporting to me that it's in most of my patches, most of my tunes, but then you know, there's there's the whole universe around tempo and and the shape of the oscillators. And, you know, I listened to I mean, I was massively into thrash metal when I was a, a teenager and into my early 20s. That's what I like to play, uh, to listen to, um, going to gigs. And so I spent a lot of time around distortion pedals. And uh, very aggressive sounds. And to me, they're as important for uh, an overall kind of sense of balance as, as the most beautiful, melting, abstract, soft, uh, melodious music. As I think we're very, very complex creatures as beings. And certainly for myself to fully or more fully reflect myself i have to listen to a bit of everything because i can find bits of myself in just about anything i can listen to and so getting now to spend my time making music full time other than you know um working on this 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 article at the moment and working with other artists in other ways and you know I have a bunch of different projects lined up um, but it's all about I think trying to connect more fully to the sense of self that is is maybe a bit submerged or hidden in ordinary life in ordinary waking life because we sort of have to blend in you know here we are sure some people can go full on and and make a living as an Arcturian 24 seven. And they're good with that. For myself, I don't have any labels. I just don't. But oh, none of that kind, at least. I mean, a wanderer generally. But what does that mean? I don't know. It just uh, it seems to mean that I don't have any specific, you know, allegiance or whatever. But just spending time making music, I think it just gets me into a place where I just feel the most real and um, the most sort of, I guess, in alignment in general. And in the research that I'm doing for this article, one of the things I'm drilling down into a little bit is the flow state, which has been around for a while. There's a um, Eastern European academic, and I cannot even begin to pronounce his name, um, but you can find his book written in 2002 called Flow. It's something about happiness. And he was trying to find what makes a life worth living. <clears throat> and a big part of the focus of that project <clears throat> was about Finding that whether people were artists or gardeners or scientists, mathematicians, physicists, whatever they might be in terms of their profession, <clears throat> there was often an experience of the flow state that came when they were most engaged in their work to the point where time and space just cease to <clears throat> exist in the normal in the normal sense our consciousness shifts into a place where we are we're uh, 
we're just a different version of ourselves in some ways, I think, or we're more fully integrated or something. It's, it's still something that every time I find myself there and emerge from it, I'm almost not sure what happened. But some of the, the tracks I listen to on this album, I, I just don't even know how they got made. You know, I, I don't remember writing them as melodies, but, but often I'll get a vision of something, some experience, and then I'll start to hear music and I'll, I'll, I'll find some of the building blocks for it. And that could be, it could be the drums, the percussion, it could be the chords, it could be the choir, the string section, could be anything. And bit by bit, you get one thing and you start to hear another in response to it. And it just develops therefrom. And I just can't think of a more joyful thing to do in life right now. There it is. Yeah, well, that's thank you for sharing all of that. Now, when, when did you start being musical or write or, or that's creating music in in your life? When I was 15 is when I started to learn to play guitar. And I remember my teacher would just give me scales to learn, you know, up and down the fretboard, back and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And because my coordination's terrible, I couldn't play really clean um, arpeggios or, or even picked scales. So I kept fumbling and ending up doing double stops and slurs and, and going back and forth out of, um, out of sequence, but I realized, wait a minute, well, hold up. What was that again? And then I would I try and repeat this mistake I made. And I thought, wait a minute, it's a melody. Because I, I know everyone will have guessed I did not have any classical training at all. There's nobody musical in my family at all. Well, in, in England anyway, my, my uncle in the Azores is uh, an awesome musician and he's made the most beautiful music I ever heard on this earth. Him and um, were in the Azores one summer and uh, my uncle José Joan was playing guitar and his wife was singing in a little church in the town where my dad was born, Riverina, and and it was it was like music made by angels. It was reverberating around this church, and I am as unchurchy as it gets. I am not a quote religious person at all. I like hanging out in churches. I love the architecture. I love the craftsmanship. I love the stained glass. I love the wood carving, the stone carving, all of that. And I got no problem with Jesus. I would love to meet that guy. If I had a time machine, that would be my top three first things where I would go and hang out. I want to know who he really was, what he was really all about. If he could set aside everything that came after, a one-to-one, -one, who was he really? What did he really say? What did he really believe? What did he value? And what effect did he have on people? Like, you know, as a researcher, obviously I want to know those things. Um, uh, I digress. Um, but so, yeah, I had no formal musical training and just picked it up. I, I had lessons, my teacher, um, this this phenomenal guy, Mike Hutchinson, he put me together with a, 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 a bass player, well, a guitar player at that time, uh, Mark Hansen. And Mark and I used to just, just hang out and just jam for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And uh, then I played in a band with some other friends from school, um, which was just a, a trip. 
I mean, it was absolutely hilarious. And yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it was, um, yeah, great fun. But uh, I just remember the drummer was so flaky about showing up and uh, it, it just drove me nuts waiting and waiting and waiting and and people not being willing to show up and and I realized that, that at that moment I was never going to play in a band professionally I, I was never going to put myself through that dealing with flaky artist types um so essentially then you know I was I was basically off doing all sorts of other things you know, professionally, one thing to another, training in 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 forestry and, and landscape management, and working in that general field for around ten years, and then um, studying journalism when I got to uh, Ireland, and I think at that time I somehow saved up enough money to get a this cheap little Gretsch Electromatic Junior Jet, single P ninety uh and a tiny little amp and an effects pedal and and i was just i felt so complete again like i hadn't had a guitar for a while and i've been traveling a lot but that was that was a big moment and then when i was there i kept having these really intense dreams that i was an absolutely phenomenal drummer a phenomenal uh sax player and so i ended up not getting a drum kit because there's no room, but then I would go and buy these instruments to see if I had this genius ability, but sadly no, but I got on all right with, you know, clarinet and saxophone. And when I was back in, when I moved to Bristol in 05, I think I, bit by bit, I put time and money into getting back into playing guitar and jamming with people and, and buying electronic, um uh bits of kit because my first passion was hip hop and electro when it was kind of starting when it was first becoming big in britain in the early 80s early to mid 80s and so i was into you know break dancing with friends and and you know some of the most complete lunatics in the town were into break dancing and so I'd hang out with them and uh yeah that was that was nuts <laughs> but an education and uh and then later on I was just obsessed with Jean-Michel Jarre and and the Blade Runner soundtrack Van Gallis's music and and on and on and on and then of course the 80s was just incredible for electronic music of all kinds. I mean, everybody was using synths and, and it was just everywhere. You couldn't, you couldn't miss it. And there was something that just turned me on about it. It just had that feeling of being cosmic music when I heard it. I mean, you know, when I was a kid hearing the Doctor Who theme tune, watching Doctor Who as a really young kid, and that was all made in analog on um, people should, if people have even a passing interest in electronic music, look up Delia Derbyshire. She was at the BBC and she was one of the pioneers of dance music, even. I mean, bizarrely, one of the first recognizable pieces of dance music. Um, was found in stuff that was in her loft. I mean, she was, you know, an eccentric and, and dropped right out of music for a long time. Vanished from the scene, but she was in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and was not even credited as being one of the authors of the, um, one of the writers of the Doctor Who theme. It's, it's a crime, but um, it just has happened with women a lot in art, <laughs> you know, over the centuries. So, yeah, so it was electronic music was just always a thing, was just always showing up. And of course, when um, Rave arrived, that was something that we seized upon. I think all us kids that have been traumatized in the Cold War 
I think when Rave showed up, dance music hit, and the drug culture, I think that we all embraced it for our own reasons. But I happen to harbor a suspicion that at least in part, it may have been living through childhood since we left school, um, my year left school uh, in 89 as the Soviet Union was, was basically packing up shop. And, um, Yeah, sorry, I, I left my phone on, it pinged and it blew my train of thought. Um, yeah. Just one second. Um, but yeah, it, dance music was just absolutely huge for, for a lot of us. And, and I, you know, found myself at plenty of, um, you know, clubs and raves and fun stuff. And, uh, and being in those spaces, uh, there was a, a club called the Whirly Gig in London, which was like a hippie rave. Is one way you might you might call it. Um, I describe it, and uh, and I'd come more from from weed and psychedelics than from you know harder drugs, and so. I particularly liked the Whirly Gig. It was what they called ethno techno, um, kind of trance music, but a lot of it was created by bands like Banco de Gaia and um, Transglobal Underground. And they had a lot of ethnic samples in their work. And so in that place, you know, on a decent dose of uh, LSD and, and speed, being in the whirly gig, and a, among those people, it was just, it was just one of the most, it was the closest thing I think I've experienced to heaven. It was just absolutely, it's one of those things that you can't ever get out of your system. It's not a thing that, you know, when I think about those experiences, it's impossible to be truly cynical about human beings because yeah, you could say everyone was on drugs, and I think that probably 99% of people were. But for me, it just was bringing out the best in people. It was breaking down barriers, and it was, for sure, opening minds. And it was taking us to places that were overwhelmingly positive, I think. Um, so... In, in almost any era of my life, in other words, electronic music has been a thing, and and it always seemed to have a connection with the cosmos, with space, and it was just always very sci-fi. I mean, when sci-fi was really busting through in the 50s and on through the 60s and 70s, electronic music was always a part of it. I mean, things like the Moog uh, theremin was part of as soon as you heard that you knew uh, an et a being of some description was about to enter the mix and so to make an album based on my sense of being a wanderer based on my feeling of wanting to get back out there among the stars just just having fun it only makes sense to me to render that um electronically and i mean everybody who, who hears the album will be the judge of of to what extent that takes them to those places i mean the the, the track titles are sometimes pretty on the nose a pretty key uh indication of what i saw when i dreamt them up things like on a low g moon that the music came first for that and then i just pictured um, myself and a close friend of mine just bouncing around on a low gravity moon. And I just hope that for all the people that hear it, they find that something that resonates with them, something that takes them somewhere they like. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah, let me ask you. And, and I, I'd say that, for example, when you mentioned 
on a low G moon, I mean, that, that one is so, it does take you there. <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. And, and um, now, now let me ask you this. Uh, for example, we, we have here on in, in Canada in, 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 in Vancouver, where I live on our cable TV, even there's an electronic uh, music channel on the cable t TV mm -hmm. and there's a new age channel. They have a new age and you, you know, you can put it on there and, and you can l l listen and it's a way to, to access things. And, and, um, and this is a question for you because um, I should self reveal myself, Gary Peter Carlson, who is one of our guests who uh, uh, runs a website uh, on on souls and will read your, 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 your soul, did a reading on me and said, Alfred, you're a wanderer. So we're, our, our show is kind of a wanderer conversation. And I'm saying that, you know, Gary did a whole analysis on me and came up with that. And, and so I can hear many resonances, resonances in your self description that resonate in me. So I've had some objective um, uh, feedback, outside feedback through Gary Peter Carlson, who mm. makes his living by analyze, uh, analyzing so, souls. And I, I'll send you his, his link sure. if you ever want to get in, get in touch with him. So I, I, I'm finding this conversation very edifying. Um, now, so I'm looking at, at your album and your music and you say it's explicitly for, uh, from your wanderer perspective mm -hmm. and, and explicitly inter, let, let's just say interdimensional. I mean, to use that, that word, uh, you know, 4G, 5G, uh, for 45D, et cetera, not, not to use the word space because people get oh, kind of crazy around that, that word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, do you find in your field of electronic music that uh, because you mentioned that many of the albums are taking you there, that there's an explicit interdimensional con content to, to albums such as you have explicitly made it interdimensional here, or is this yours kind of a forerunner here so that other people, you know, other people are not saying landing on another planet or, you know, uh, da, 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 da. is this something, is there a genre of your albums or is this, uh, is this a first one? You know, is this a, a kind of a, what, what has been your experience? Well, in terms of genre, I honestly would have no clue what to call it. Um, when you upload to Bandcamp and to, I use a service called DistroKid, and you basically upload all your stuff there, put in all your details, and they will distribute it to all the streaming platforms to, you know, Spotify and Apple and Amazon and it's about I think about 30 of them and YouTube music and on and on and um, when you do that they ask you what's your primary genre 
and I'll look at it and there might only be like electronic and I'll tick electronic and I'll say, well, what's its secondary genre? And I might say ambient and, and leave it at that. But it's not all ambient. There's stuff that's, you know, pretty up-tempo in there. I mean, a lot of what I what I do is kind of semantically um, <laughs> challenging. You know, it, it's, you know, doing the books, let's say, people would, um, you know, default into saying, Miguel and Don's a ufologist. And, I would, and, and my issue with ufology is always that the, thir the first thing that comes to mind, let's say, is the idea of beings coming here to study humans and calling it carology. I mean, who it's... Yeah, we, 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 we just, just to jump in there, hmm. uh, we're, we're launching uh, this, this coming month, uh, Omniversity. Mm -hmm. uh, at at omniversity.info and and omniversity has courses in exopolitics, exosciences, sci sciences, and spiritual sciences. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the books that you write, in my mind, fall in all of those categories. Th their contents fall in those categories. That is, ufology is not a word that I use in my professional category. Besides, it was the US Air Force that invented that word for disinformational purposes. So I don't even go there into that word. It's kind of an artificial word. Yeah, we and use, I, and I think that it's, it's, yeah. it's archaic. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, Part of the reason that I did We Are the Disclosure was because doing, doing Meet the Hybrids and meeting the hybrids, the people in that book, it so radically reshaped my sense of the subject and dr dragged it far further along that spectrum from sort of, if you like, material to spiritual where on the one hand, you've got the very sort of masculine end of the spectrum. You have all the sort of hardware, the tangible physical stuff. Right. And it's about politics and government. And, and it's, it is very intellectual, that yeah. whole piece of it. But then as you move along that, when you start to talk about experiences, and what the experiences are, they are fundamentally culture, consciousness altering. And people generally, it seems to me, tend to progress along that, along that spectrum. They might start with a, a UFO sighting and want to know what the hell was that thing? What was that? And then do years of research, reading watching, absorbing on all of those, or the ufology piece of it, which is, you know, the craft and what the government knows and where they've crashed and have we retrieved them and are there bodies and all that piece. But eventually you will start to meet people who say, well, I've been in experience since I was six and I'm now 81. And this is what I've learned from the beings. These are the experiences I've had. These are the aspects of myself that have grown. And then you realize that, well, there's not just one person. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of these people around the world who have been affected in this way by these experiences. And much as it's reasonable to have a level of skepticism about all people and all claims. It's also, it seems to me, unreasonable to write it all off 
as just one single phenomenon. Like Carl Jung said, well, it's, um, he said it's something like, um, well, basically they're imaginary. We are imagining them into existence, these craft. And, and I forget what it was, whether it was something after World War II when the horrors that we'd witnessed or it was something religious. I forget exactly how he came to his view of it. Yeah, he 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 called them mandalas, I think, or something. Mandalas, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So the so there's a, an example of somebody writing off everything as one thing, and skeptics. I mean, a true skeptic is is not the kind of skeptics that we see. I, I think a true skeptic in terms of the literal meaning of the word skepticism, essentially is, I don't know, let's find out. Let's ask questions. Let's be, let's be open-minded. Let's yeah. be open-minded. Not, um, you know, I, I don't know about this, but it makes me fearful and uncomfortable. And I would like to deny that it exists and find a way to write off as much as possible and ignore the rest. And sure, nothing in this world is for everything is for everyone i mean not even you know there are these people who believe you don't even don't even have to eat so and then there's people who there's plenty of people who are suicidal they don't believe that even life itself is for them so in other words not to label the point but nothing is for everyone it's not that everybody has to get alongside this topic they don't if they don't care they've got better things to do that's their mission yeah. that's their yeah. purpose in life great now I, here, yeah hmm. very interesting now here 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 is a crucial question that i at least would like to ask you and we have your album into into galactic very interesting title do you find many albums of, of electronic music, electro music, that have an explicit interdimensional exoscientific, exoconscious content like yours does? Well, there's one fantastic example that I can that I can share with the viewers and listeners, which is a band called Eat Static. And they were a sort of side project-ish of a psychedelic rock band called Osric Tentacles that make just the best psychedelic rock. They're a British band. I saw them on a lot of acid at Brighton University back in the 90s. And, um, and that, was, that was a cosmic encounter. That was just absolutely extraordinary. And they, they had guys in the band that liked um, the synth side of, of the music. And they created this band that made sort of um trance music very broadly and they had a great album called abduction and there's tracks on there like gulf breeze and so you you ask yourself well what is it's we know it's an album all about ufos and ets and so forth so what's gulf breeze and that's i mean that and that's a killer tune oh my god on tune it was the one that i played everybody it's the one they put on every mixtape for people i said oh my god i just found this band eat static i found this album abduction check out gulf breeze i mean if you're driving maybe don't put it on because man it's almost impossible not to hit the gas when you hear this anyway um there are things like Josh Wink's High State of Consciousness, which was just about the biggest worldwide dance hit of that time. It was absolutely massive. And I have 
like still somewhere, I think I've got a CD single of it with like five or six remixes on it. And a higher state of consciousness. And that was a massive worldwide hit. And I would love to find Josh Wink. God knows where he is these days. I've never looked him up. I don't know where he is or what he does, if he's still making, you know, hard trance or whatever he's doing. Don't know. But I would love to talk to him. I mean, he could, I'm sure he could write a book on the question of what was the effect of your music on audiences in uh, at gigs i mean he must have played that all over the world and he must have met people other djs other people in the industry that said oh my god i just played high state of consciousness at a gig in rio and there's like you know 300,000 people losing their shit to this tune but I wonder what it did do. And if people started to dive into, well, what does he mean, higher state of consciousness? So I don't think he was alone. I think that there's a lot of people were probably thinking that way, but because it's the arts, everybody's gonna bring their own stuff to it. And that could be anything at all. And it might be something very explicit in a lyric, and then it might not be. It might be something like um, like that tune Waterfall, and I can't think who it's by, but it was, again, it was around the same time. And, um, and it would always be played in the same sets as High State of Consciousness. I think they were the same period, that sort of 92, 93 period. And I think that people were doing a lot of psychedelics as well. That, well, I know they were. Um, so, in, in many ways, you know, we called it our summer of love, that period, sort of 92, 93, was that those period in the 90s, that period in the 90s was like our 60s, I think, when many, 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 many people all over the world were thinking about um, these kinds of issues around consciousness and, you know, being high as a kite, with a hell of a lot of people, thousands of people, all in a state of ecstasy, listening to music, being absolutely synchronized by the beat. I do think that it does something to you. And it would be really interesting to dive into more of what that did for people. And I corresponded recently with a guy who goes by DJ Monkey Pilot, and he is the guy, uh, he's the DJ at uh, Whirly Gig, and they've taken, they in the summer they take it on the road and they go and set up a big Whirly Gig tent in all the music festivals. So I'm sort of curious to um, drop him a note and ask him, uh, it's one of the tracks on my first album, it's called Whirly Nights. And when I, and I've got a music video I did on my um, Sakamaru YouTube channel, in which I got from them about, I don't know, 50, 40 or 50 photos from Whirly Gig when it was at Shoreditch Town Hall in London, the time I was going, 92, 93. And I've made a music video and created this track that just reminded me of the music they played at the end of the night. So what they would do is they would bring, they would, they would pull this huge piece of red, of circular fabric from the front of the stage, and everyone in the middle of the dance floor would sit as fast as they could because this thing would just come at you. It's crazy, um, and all the people around the edge would wave it up and down, and they would launch these these orbs, these, these balloons that were like, I don't know, three or four feet across in my memory. Maybe they were smaller, who knows? They seem pretty huge. And they would launch that and there would be just incredible light show happening. And they would play this very, this almost shamanic kind of music when everybody was, was sat under this, this parachute. And it was like, it was the end of the night and it was a ceremony. That's how it felt. It had the feeling of ceremony to it. And I think for all the people who were 
in that place at that time, I, I'm sure that they feel a, a sense of kinship, that they were there at an important time. And at the front of the stage, right at the top, overlooking the dance floor, was a gigantic image of the planet. And I wonder what that did to people. I'm absolutely certain that part of me being becoming an environmentalist came from that experience of being in that state with those people, staring at this image of the world, the, of the planet. And in fact, that image, um, the blue marble, they'd taken the first ever or um, it was the first ever clear image, free of all clouds. So I don't know if it was a composite, I can't remember the history, but it was one of those things, I think it was in the 1960s that this happened. And at that point, I've always read that that had a profound impact on human consciousness, seeing ourselves as Terrans for the first time, understanding that that's what your home looks like and you're all on it. Oh, well, you know, I'm very curious about two questions. One question is, what is, what is your vision or what are your, your plans for, what, where would you like into galactic, to go, what, 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 what would you like to see it go? And the second question is, you as, as a creator, do you do gigs? Do you do concerts? What is your future publicly in this arena? So over to you. Yeah, I don't do gigs. Um, I'm disabled, so, you know, getting um, a powered wheelchair in and out of nightclubs. I know people who do it. Um, there's, uh, there's someone I know in Bristol um, who goes by Mr. Spoon, who does do gigs and yeah, is um, just will not be stopped in, in life. Um, yeah, she's extraordinary, um, but that's not my bag. I, I, I've had all the clubbing that I, that I am up for in life. Um, what would I like the album to do? Well, I'm just content for it to sail off into the world and meet new people. And, and the fascinating thing about it is that there are no two ver versions of this that are alike in that every consciousness that experiences it hears it in a unique way, just in the way that our own auditory equipment functions, our consciousness, our moods. I mean, when I, when early listeners had, before it was released, I'd given I'd sent preview uh, codes to people and I was getting different bits of feedback and it was so interesting to me how much their mood would shape the tracks that they responded to and for myself I'm the same you know I, I've only listened to the whole album through start to finish once and it was interesting because I have to take um, a kind of tranquilizer late at night to help with restless legs. I have uh, MS and, you know, it does all, anyone around neurological um, issues knows that it's, um, it's no joy. And sometimes when you're relaxing, you can start getting, you know, little spasms and things that can keep you awake. So um, I don't take cannabis for it. I did at one time, it didn't really seem to do much, but I have this tranquilizer that I take and that seems to help. <laughs> and this one morning when I was putting the finishing touches to the album, I was taking my morning's <laughs> supplements and I was just uh, distracted. So I, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you look at it, I kept going down the, um, the little 
tablet organizer and I took 900 milligrams of this tranquilizer and I thought, okay, I've got two options. Um, number one, I could go and throw up. Uh, number two, I can work with it and make it work for me and use it to create a listening party of one. And, and I mean, I, wow. I mean, I, I have no idea that's what the drug did because I take it at night. So I, don't, I have no idea what its, what its effects really were because I'm asleep. So to be awake and to be that um, medicated, I had not experienced that in a long time, but it did put me in a mood which I couldn't shift my mood because it was, you know, a, um, a drug in my system that was sort of locking me to a specific um, level of consciousness almost. And, and it was fascinating. It was really interesting to hear, to experience it with all the visuals that I already had as I was making it, but those visuals would be deepened and I would be even closer to the experiences. And then there was the final track, which is called One Always, um, which is about myself and someone very close to me and the sense that we have always been incarnating together and traveling the stars together and having all these adventures. And, and as I was thinking about this and hearing this tune, I mean, I just think I, I cried tears of joy all the way through that piece. And that was very special and personal for me. Um, because every time I heard those melodies, that's what it took me to. And, you know, I you know, it's not easy to find the right um, titles for things, but that's as close as I could get it, this sense of this eternal oneness. And, you know, in many ways, it feels like every time I create a track, I thought that's the best piece of music I've ever made. And I don't know how on earth I'm going to climb the mountain again. But because I was doing something that was so personal to me and so important in my experience, in terms of my day-to-day -day life, it just is better when I'm connected to that aspect of myself and I don't feel like I'm marooned here. It was almost like my escape pod. It was like having my own flying saucer. And anytime I felt, felt like it, when I come in here to work and I fire up the modular and all the rest of it, and I start hearing those sounds, Oof, it's like I'm gone and it just always feels like therapy like like I'm in a space of of love and personal integration and then of course when you do this kind of thing when you make any art I firmly believe that you are opening up all your channels so things are flowing through you things are getting into the world through you and I know that anyone who does this kind of work has, um, has to keep half an eye on what is coming through and what is coming into the world. And, you know, it's a matter of being personally aware of it. I mean, for myself, I just want to make music that feels good, that, that makes me feel good, that makes me feel better and that I know I can give this album to anybody with the with integrity that I feel like I'm doing something positive for them because I think it can take them to a positive place. And, and for me, as much as I think art is a personal indulgence and it's an important part of processing experience and, and reflecting and all of those things, I do think that one of the most important jobs it can do is, is to give us healing. 
And I think every time, certainly when I finish a track and I've, I've taken some time away from it, because they all take about 30 hours more or less to make. And you can hear the same track, like, I don't know, 50 odd times as you're finessing it. Um, but when I've, when I get that bit of distance from it and I, and I hear those, those pieces, I always go somewhere good as a result. And that to me is the acid test. I mean, when I've tried making tracks that maybe are written in a minor key, maybe have some edge or darkness to them, you know, I find I just don't want to finish it. I just don't want to put that out into the world because I feel like the world is pretty replete when it comes to darkness. So I think one of the most important things to me has always been trying to make the world that I want to live in. And so if I can make music that makes people feel good, that takes them somewhere positive on whatever level, um, I feel like I'm kind of completing my mission and I feel like I am in integrity. Very good. So uh, for, for our audience, th this is going out live now on YouTube, by the way. And, and so where can people get your album? Um, well, they can buy it on Bandcamp and it's Bandcamp. If people know anything about it, you can often set it to people can pay whatever they like. Um, so there's absolute access. If people want to pay, I don't think I'm paying nothing. I, I don't remember the, the fine print, but anyway, um, they can download it for nothing or next to nothing or, or pay what they like. Um, it's streaming on everything. Um, it's on, on Spotify and uh, Amazon Music and Apple Music and, uh, and all the rest. I mean, if, if you listen to, and it's all over the world as well. There, there's um, streaming services that are almost uniquely set up in Asia and all the rest of it. So almost wherever you are, you'll be able to find it and listen to it. Wonderful. So it's wandering the world, to use the metaphor. Yeah. That's great. Well, you know, I thought we've, we've sort of come to the end of our, our, our conversation phase, but that we could complete our conversation phase by maybe listening to a friendly star. Is that a, is that a good one? Um, or, or some other one? What, what, what ooh, do we think? You know, it's really hard to tell. I mean, what do you think? Because they all mean different things to me. Yeah. And um, so well, it's tough. What it's does tough a friendly to star mean to you? A friendly star is really upbeat and joyous because it is my feeling of getting back to a place where everything makes sense to me. In other words, contrasting my experience on earth where I am perennially baffled. I mean, I've studied humans my whole life and I am baffled more by the day rather than less so. And so a friendly star was just that feeling of getting to a place that was just, was friendly where people just, where people are friendly, where there isn't this, this crazy wretched fear that people have of each other, where somebody is different, if they are a different color to you, if they are, if, if their sexuality or their gender identity is something that baffles and frightens you, you can't handle it. It's just, you know, to me, well, the differences yeah. are, are the joys. And so, you know, things like a friendly star reflect that sense of being back somewhere where it all makes sense. And, you know, and it's just, it is that one love thing. Now, isn't that the 5D new earth or what we're moving toward? Or is, is, that, is, is that too far away? 
Oof. Well, um, I mean, I would love to think that we'll all survive long enough to get there, um, given the way that the world is going rapidly. But um, I honestly, I, I don't know. And I think that it's there's a real wisdom in ignorance. There's a real wisdom in saying, here is the limit of my knowledge is the limit of what I am sure of and just allowing for the possibility for other possibilities for a range of possibilities for a range of potential truths to exist I feel like there's a, an important place for that given how divided people have become that they can't tolerate the possibility of, of someone else's uh, values or position on something. I mean, it just, I mean, this place just seems to have absolutely lost its mind in the last sort of four or five years. Well, then that doesn't it seem that we should, a good place to, to play would be a friendly star as kind of a, a goal or, or sure. not? Sure, okay. I mean, I don't, I don't even remember what it sounds like. Okay, here we go. Oh, and thank you, by the way. This is such an inspiration. And I'm sure the audience is finding it so. And our wider audience will be finding it so. Thank you so much. I have been introduced to the true wanderer, Miguel Mendoza, that I had no idea today Thank you deeply. My pleasure, always. So what are your thoughts? You're you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, it's um yeah, I I guess I was just remembering all the different moments of putting that together. But that feeling of um the thing that makes me really happy is 
is when the uh, the choir kicks in. That that's something that I try not to overuse on the album. But when I discovered that, I just kept hearing choirs when I was creating tunes, and um, I found a way to add choirs and to control that. And on this particular track, it feels like those are the people that are that populate this friendly star that it's that chorus that uh, greets us and the track time to meet my soul group i think has some of some of that in it but that was about excuse me that was about the feeling of encountering my soul group after this life and there'd be people from this from this world that I've known in this life that I'm absolutely certain about that soul group. And some I love dearly, they're close friends and other people have come and gone, but they still feel so important that I feel like we're going to meet again. And so I think that track, Time to Meet My Soul Group, is the one that at least in the last couple of times I heard it just really kind of stopped me in my tracks because it really felt like it was taking me there. I mean, I had an experience where when I was um, regressed by Barbara Lamb during the uh, research phase of Meet the Hybrids, we, we were going back to some angelic encounters that I've had down here. And, but, I spontaneously found myself out among the stars and became aware of these kind of voices behind me as such. And the more attention I paid to them, the more they paid to me. And it just became in moments, this feeling of just, the, it's a joy I can't express. I can't find the words for it, but it was like, the biggest, it was like a cosmic surprise birthday party. And when I looked around to, to, to see what was there, it was just this real dense field that just extended out for, I don't, I don't even know. I mean, distances in those situations are impossible to gauge, but it was just this absolutely cosmically enormous field of these tiny pinpoints of light. And it was like this field of intelligence. That's the first way I described it, a field of intelligence. And it was aware of me, I was aware of it, and we were absolutely bound up together. It was total connection and total joy in, in the encounter between one consciousness and another, or one consciousness and many, but it was all part of the same thing. So when I hear Time to Meet My Soul Group as a piece of music, it instantly takes me back there. And so, and this, it sort of gives me shivers in a really, in a really delicious and profoundly positive way. And again, that's that's the power of music. And so every time I hear these tunes for the rest of my life, they bake in all those visions and those experiences and those sensations in the way that, I mean, I'm sure you can name three or four songs off the top of your head that you find really evocative, that every time you hear a certain song, it makes you cry, or it reminds you of a place, a time, an experience, a group of people, a vision, whatever it is. So I am, I am always happy and proud to be making music and sharing it with people and adding to that tradition and being a part of it. Well, Miguel Mendoza, thank you so much for creating this and for sharing it with us. And, uh, uh, We'll be sharing it far and wide, and uh, 
we'll be immersing ourselves in time to meet our souls group. And this is certainly a frequency raiser for us as well. So thank you very much for uh, taking your time to share with us and raising our frequency and our awareness. Thank you. My pleasure.